and uh, we will start the differential geometry session. Today is differential geometry sessions. And uh, today's plenary speaker is Professor Richard Bamra from UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm honored to introduce him, his, his work. So he is a very strong geometric analysis, especially the retro on three manifold. And he, he established the new theory and, uh, uh, give, uh, and obtained uh, many new results. So today's title is Uniqueness of uh, Weak Solution to the Rich Flow and Topological Application. Please start. All right, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, uh, um, before I start, I just want to take the opportunity to express my gratitude to the organizers of the conference. I'm, uh, for basically organizing this conference twice. Um, so it must be really frustrating to having to cancel the first event and then almost having to start from new. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think it worked out really well. Um, then, um, oh yeah. And then secondly, I also wanted to uh, take this opportunity to make a quick announcement. So um, I'll be teaching an online class on Ricci flow this fall semester. So. Um, if you're a UCB student uh, and you're interested, then um, uh, this is uh, Math 277, I think. And if you're a student from some other university, um, uh, feel free to email me. I'll, I'll, I'll hope I'll be able to share the Zoom link uh, with you. Um, and, um, and so you'll be able to attend this okay, well. Any Any questions, sorry? No, I think somebody is not muted. Do you need to mute, mute people? How do, how do I mute people? And I muted myself. Okay. Um, all right. So let me get back to the um, to 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 the main talk. All right. So everything that I'll talk about today is uh, going to be joint work with uh, Bruce Kleiner from NYU, and um, this talk will be mainly a survey on uh, recent uh, work concerning concerning the uniqueness of weak solutions to the Ricci flow, mainly dimension three. Um, and topological applications that uh, that follow from this, and the uh, so the uh, the talk will be structured in um, in three different parts. So I'll actually change the order a little bit. So first, I'll be telling you about these topological results because they're fairly easy to state, and then they'll serve as a motivation for the second part of the talk, in which I'll talk about Ricci flow, uh, weak solutions, uniqueness, and continuous dependence. So this is going to be a more analytic uh, part. And then if time permits, then there will be a short third part where I'll try to explain to you, at least in certain cases, how these analytic results can be used to uh, give, um, uh, to, um, get, uh, to, to, to deduce uh, topological results. All right, so if you're, um, if you're not so interested in topology, then I'll recommend that you wait for part two. I'll start over again. And also, you know, if, if, if you don't care much about analysis, then part one or two, uh, three will hopefully be very helpful. And also in part two, I'll be showing many pictures, so I hope it won't be too scary. All right, so let me um, start with the, um, uh, with the first part. I'll first uh, say what the topological results are. And to do this, I'll just make some basic definitions. I'll just uh, tell you which uh, setting I'm interested in. So I'll mostly in this talk be interested in three-dimensional compact and orientable manifolds, um, and I'll denote them by M. And ever, whenever we talk about these types of manifolds, um, um, I should recall that the, some of the topology of three manifolds uh, by now is sufficiently well understood due to the resolution of the Poincaré and conge uh, geometrization conjectures by Perelman, and this was done using Ricci flow. So, um, so we, we can completely classify all three manifolds to a sufficiently good degree at least. Um, and so what, what becomes interesting for me now is uh, studying objects that are, that are built upon these three manifolds. And there are three main objects that I'll be considering. First of all, I'll be considering the space of all Riemannian metrics on a given manifold, and I'll denote this by met M. So every point corresponds to one Riemannian metric on the manifold. And then um, I'll be considering a subset, namely the space of all metrics with positive scalar curvature. So that's a subset of the um, space of metrics. And then lastly, I'll also be interested in the diffeomorphism group of the manifold. So this is the space of all diffeomorphisms from M to M. So maps that are 
uh, from M to M that are smooth and that have smooth inverses. And um, you know, these are, of course, very big spaces. And I'll equip these spaces with the C infinity topology. So that's the most standard topology that you can put on them. And uh, the topology basically means that convergence with respect to this topology is equivalent to convergence with respect to every CK norm. So that's somehow the, the, the most natural one that you could think of. And then uh, my goal, at least in this, in this part of the talk, will be, will be to classify these spaces up to homotopy and hopefully using Ricci though. So again, those are really huge spaces. So it's unlikely that we can classify them up to homeomorphy, but um, at least we could hope to try to classify them up to homotopy. All right. And then I feel like I should already get one point because um, I uh, should notice that the space of metrics is contractible. And so that's maybe not hard to, to figure out, you know, um, um, because it's, it's contractible because space of metrics is a, um, is a, is a convex subset in, in a huge vector space. Okay? So if it's convex, then it's, it's contractible. Um, and it's convex because if you take a linear combination of two or more Riemannian metrics, then you get another Riemannian metric. So this is how this, this works. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, somehow raise your hand or let me know. Um, 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 Richard, this is a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see the chat. Can you can you tell it to oh, me? Oh, um, yeah. Someone asked if f is a differentiable, but not a topological manifold. Oh, it's a differentiable manifold. And uh, oh, by the way, I do see. I, now I've pulled up the chat. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's everything is going to be a differentiable manifold. And then in dimension three, every topological manifold has a different, uh, a unique differentiable structure. Okay. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the the question. All right, so um, now let me, let me so, so the space of metrics is, con is contractible. And um, uh, so let me move on to the space of positive scalar curvature metrics. So that's an open subset because um, perturbations of metrics with positive scalar curvature are again, again, have positive scalar curvature. And so here's the first result, the, the main result, which is due to Bruce Kleiner and myself from last year. And we show, and so the result basically states that the space of, or exactly states that the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on M for any, any given compact three manifold is either contractible or empty, right? So that's a, you know, one of the shortest theorems I've ever shown. shown. So uh, just to digest, um, there are maybe manifolds and there are manifolds that don't admit metrics of positive scalar curvature. So then the space is empty, but if there are so, such metrics on the manifold, then the space, uh, then this space is contractible. Okay, and contractible means uh, simply connected and all higher homotopy groups vanish. All right, so just in order to, to show you why this problem was, is interesting, let me just uh, say, make a few comments on the history of this problem. Uh, first of all, the corresponding result is true in dimension two, and this can be seen relatively easily, for example, using the uniformization theorem, and I'll also show you a proof using Ricci flow later. And, um, However, like the first time that this type of question became interesting was in a paper by Hitchin from uh, 1974. And then there was work uh, by Grom of Lawson and Botvinnik, Hanke Schick and Walsh um, in which they basically construct uh, uh, obstructions as to why this space in higher dimensions is non-trivial. Um, but somehow the, somehow the conjecture was always that the, uh, the, the, the space is trivial in dimension three. And the first positive uh, result in this direction was achieved by Marquez in 2011, who used Ricci flow with surgery and who could show that the space is path connected or if we quotient out by the diffeomorphism group is path connected, which is of course uh, weaker than contractible. All right, so if there are not, not any more questions um, on this, maybe I'll, I'll continue to the next theory. Um, so, so in the next, uh, on the next few slides, I want to talk about diffeomorphism groups. Um, so uh, say what our results are about diffeomorphism groups. And here the theorem is not, uh, not as easy to state because the you know, diffeomorphism groups have more structure. So instead, let me, um, uh, let me start with, uh, actually start with the history of this problem. So first of all, maybe the first time that diffeomorphism groups were studied was in a paper by Smale from 1958, uh, in which he showed that the space of diffeomorphisms on S2 is homotopy equivalent to O3, so the set of uh, orthogonal three times three matrices. So in other words, if you have a diffeomorphism on S2, there's somehow 
uh, a consistent way of deforming this diffeomorphism into, um, into an orthogonal transformation. And then, so in the same um, paper, Smail conjectured that the same thing should be true if we increase the dimension by one. And this was called the Smail conjecture. And it was proven by Hatcher in 1983. Uh, however, in dimension three, there are many more other interesting manifolds. And one interesting class of manifolds would be the uh, would be spherical space forms. So those are uh, the round three sphere um, quotient out by, by a discrete subgroup, a finite subgroup. Um, and so in order to understand this, uh, the, the diffeomorphism group, it's helpful to consider the trivial injection where we take the isometry group. So for S3, this would be O4 and um, embed it into the space of diffeomorphisms. Okay, so every isometry is of course a diffeomorphism. So that's, a, that's an injection. So now the generalized smell conjecture just states that this map is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so, um, so essentially, Smale conjecture actually states the same thing, so that uh, the injection of O4 into the diffeomorphism group is a homotopy equivalence. All right, so this, um, this conjecture was verified in a hand for a handful of other spherical space forms. So um, there are lens spaces, there's RP3, and so on and so forth. And for a few of these uh, classes of uh, spherical space forms, the conjecture was, um, was established but it remained open for RP3, for example, which is a surprisingly simple example. And also all the proofs so far are purely topological and, and quite technical, and there's no uniform treatment. And by this, I mean somehow basically most of the proofs that address certain special cases of the general Smale conjecture, they somehow used some methods of cutting the manifold into easier pieces and then to apply uh, the Smale conjecture proven by Hatcher to each of these pieces. And so depending on what kind of spherical space form you had, there were like different tricks of cutting this uh, spherical space form into, into easier pieces. So, you, you know, so, so there's no, that, that's what I mean by no, no uniform treatment. Okay, so now let me state our main result. Yeah, so really the good. result just states that the generalized smell conjecture is true. Okay, so make, let me also make a few remarks. So first of all, this is, this is a proof via Ricci flow. So it's not a purely topological proof and it's, in actually the first purely topological application of Ricci flow was in Perelman's work, which is, was about 15 years ago. Um, so, so we're quite happy about this. And it also gives us a uniform treatment of all spherical space forms. So in fact, in, in our proof, we don't even have to understand what kind of spherical space forms there are. It just works for every case. And it also gives an alternative proof in the S3 case. So it's an alternative to, um, to a Hatcher's proof. Um, and if you're interested in digging a little deeper, I just want to uh, remark that, there, uh, that we've somehow posted two proofs. So first of all, there's a short proof, only about 30 pages. Uh, of course, it also relies on, on longer work, but it's, more, it's easy to read and relatively self-contained, uh, where, um, where we prove this theorem um, uh, under some additional assumptions, for example, not in the case RP3. Um, but it's somehow, uh, and then there is a long proof, a uh, long paper where we uh, prove the full conjecture. So if you're interested in, in reading something, I recommend this uh, short proof. And I, if I, there's time, I'll talk about this also at the end of the talk. Um, also, I want to mention, as I said, our proofs gives a uniform treatment of all spherical space forms. But uh, on top of this, uh, the same techniques also apply for almost all other uh, three manifolds, uh, where, where, where some other conjecture would make sense. Um, and, uh, and it would basically give the same result. And so the only caveat is that, uh, that for most of these cases, there, there already exist proofs. So for example, if we take a closed and hyperbolic manifold, then we have the same homotopy equivalence between isometry group and diffeomorphism group. But this was proven by Gabay um, in 2001. Um, and if, um, if M is a spherical, uh, geometric, and has maximal symmetry, then we get the same statement. And this is actually new in the non hoc and infraneal case, but was established in many of the other cases. And then if the manifold is covered by S2 cross R, there's a slightly different statement. And again, this was proven by Hatcher in a different paper. Um, but it, but in, it, in the end, it somehow gives a uniform treatment, which I think is, is still very, very nice. All right, are there any questions on the, um, on the specific results? So if not, then I'll, um, I'll, this is the last slide where I want to uh, dive a bit deeper into the, to the technicality. So what I want to show you now is what the study of diffeomorphism groups could have to do with Ricci flow. 
And I want to show you one lemma, which is probably a folklore, uh, which gives you a, a relation and hopefully a first idea what, what the relation could be. So the lemma states the following, um, consider a manifold like a spherical space form that admits a metric of constant curvature and just fix one of, the, one of these metrics of constant curvature, for example, fix a round metric on, on S3. Now, the lemma states that the homotopy equivalence be uh, between isometric group and diffeomorphism group, uh, so the thing that we want to show is equivalent to another statement concerning the space of all metrics on M of constant curvature. So maybe the statement that this space is contractible. Okay, so let me just, uh, uh, just highlight, uh, emphasize this again. If we, for example, take the three sphere, of course, up to isometry, there's only one round metric or constant curvature metric on the three sphere. But here in this space, I'm really interested in all the different metrics that are isometric to the three sphere. All right, so since the proof is very short, let me just uh, tell you the proof in case you're interested. Um, so how does the proof work? Well, we can construct, um, uh, there's a straightforward way of constructing a map that maps the diffeomorphism group to the space of constant curvature metric which just takes every diffeomorphism of the manifold and pulls, uh, pulls back as um, maps it to the pullback of the metric by the diffeomorphism. Okay. And so it can be shown relatively qu quickly that this is a fiber bundle and the fiber just consists of all diffeomorphisms that uh, leave that metric invariant. Um, and now you can just apply a long exact homotopy sequence argument. And this basically tells you that uh, the first map being a homotopy equivalence is uh, is equivalent to saying that the last space is contractible. All right. Okay. So, and uh, saying something about the space of metrics uh, maybe a bit more uh, uh, is, is an, um, a, a reasonable question for Ricci flow. So let me just, uh, so the lemma now reduces both of the results that I mentioned previously to one common theorem um, concerning spaces of metrics, namely that the space of PSC metrics or this uh, positive scalar curvature metrics or the space of constant curvature metrics, uh, cons uh, positive constant curvature metrics are either contractible or empty. And so this is the theorem that I want to focus on for the rest of the, the talk. So we can completely forget about the diffeomorphism group. All right, are there any questions? Uh, this result, yes, the, uh, the lemma holds in all dimensions. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, but uh, of course, Proving this is hard, and this, this is not always true in all dimensions. Um, all right, so let me move on to the second part. So, so if, you got, um, if you got lost in the first part here, that's a new place where you can start over. Um, so in this part, uh, I want to quickly introduce Ricci flows, then talk about Ricci flows with surgery, uh, talk about weak solutions, um, um, talk about uniqueness, and then continuous dependence. Okay. So let's uh, start uh, um, as elementary as we can. So what's a Ricci flow? Well, a Ricci flow is a smooth family of Riemannian metrics on a given manifold that's parameterized by a time, param time parameter t, which runs on a time interval. And the Ricci flow equation reads that the time derivative of the metric is minus two times the Ricci curvature. And the reason why uh, this uh, equation is interesting is because if you write this equation down in suitable local coordinates, then, uh, then it looks like a heat equation on the metric. And so therefore, the hope is that in some sense that this flow um, uh, improves or homogenizes a given metric. And this is what, what we would like to make um, more, more rigorous in the, in the following. Okay. And um, oh, often, often also this Ricci flow equation is coupled with some initial condition where we prescribe the metric at time zero. All right, so one of the first results on Ricci flow is a short time in existence result due to Hamilton, which was proven in the paper where Ricci flow was first uh, suggested. Um, and it states that for any initial condition G0, this initial value problem has a unique solution for some maximal time T on a compact manifold. So, so if T is in infinity, then this flow exists for all times. And if it's finite, uh, then it somehow ceases to exist. And we say that it develops a singularity at time T. And it can be shown that we can um, uh, detect the singularity by the fact that the curvature blows up as we approach the singular time. So here is, um, here is a basic example, or maybe the most basic example that you could think of when, when we talk about uh, singularity, which is the round shrinking sphere. 
So in this example, we take the initial condition to be the standard round sphere. And then the flow will shrink the sphere and develop a singularity at some time, t um, 1 over 2 n minus 1, I think. And the metric will shrink down linearly, so um, uh, proportionally to the remaining time. Okay. Um, of course, we are more interested in what happens if we start the flow with some uh, arbitrary Riemannian metric, which um, may not, not look uh, this, this nice. And so in, in order to give us a, somehow a quick idea, um, it is helpful to first consider the two-dimensional case. Um, and um, I would say it's safe to say that uh, Ritchie flow in dimensions two is, is pretty well understood uh, um, uh, these days. And so, he, so here's the uh, result that I want to focus on. This, this is due to Hamilton and Chow. And it states that if we're on a two sphere, then for any initial condition, we develop a singularity at finite time. We can actually compute the, the time when the singularity occurs in terms of the volume or area of the initial metric. And now if we rescale the metric by the remaining time, divided by the remaining time, you remember the metric contracts. So this is, so we would just divide again by the remaining time then the metric uh, converges to a round metric on, on, the, on this manifold. So a constant curvature metric. All right, so, so this basically tells us, so I think this is, this is a very striking result. So no matter how complicated the, the metric is that we start with, the flow will always somehow improve the metric and uh, asymptotically um, produce a, a, a round metric. And so this theorem um, you know, can be viewed as a theorem of understanding Ricci flows on a single manifold or um, it can also be used to reprove the uniformization theorem. But I would like to take a slightly different point of view here. So what I would like to do is I would like to interpret this result um, as a result on the space of all Riemannian metrics on the two sphere. And so let me, let me draw this picture. You know, so it's just a schematic picture of how we should think of this. Um, so what I've drawn here is the space of metrics, so of all Riemannian metrics on M. And then there's a subspace consisting of the space of all the metrics of positive scalar curvature, or in dimension two, that's the space of, also the space of positive Gauss curvature. And then within the space, there is the space of metrics of constant curvature. And so now the Ricci flow can be thought of as some, some kind of dynamical system on this, on this space, or in other words, some vector field whose uh, trajectories are solutions to the Ricci flow. Um, and um, now if you wanted to understand the result of Hamilton and Chow in this picture, then this would basically tell us that any trajectory uh, starting from any point in the space will asymptotically give us some element in the space of constant curvature metrics. And moreover, we, we get a little more. We also know that since we, uh, it's, it's not hard to, to verify that the space of positive scalar curvature metrics is actually also preserved by this flow. So um, if we start within this intermediate space, then we indeed uh, remain within this intermediate space. And so, so now if you think of this um, you know, result, then, so then of Hamilton and Chow, it basically tells us that the, um, that the Ricci flow provides some kind of deformation retraction of the space of metrics or the space of positive scalar curvature metrics of S2 onto the space of constant curvature metrics. Of course, there's a little bit of more work that you have to do. You have to maybe rescale and have to be have to worry about limits, but but this can be made made rigorous. Okay? So so this this result really gives us a deformation retraction on these spaces, and therefore it tells us that all these spaces are homotopy equivalent to one another. And so now, since the space of metrics is contractible, this tells us that all these spaces are contractible. And then therefore, by the lemma that I showed you a few slides ago. This proves the Smail conjecture in dimension two. Okay, so this proves that it gives an alternative proof of the two-dimensional version of this Smail conjecture. Okay, so of course this was proven using different techniques when the Smail proved it first. Um, are there any questions to this? Okay, so this is somehow what we can do in dimension two. So everything is really nice um, and, and works out really well. So what? What I want to focus on is, is basically I want to do the same picture, I want to get the same picture in dimension three or apply the same method in dimension three to obtain these uh, main results. But we'll soon see that we'll run into some difficulties. So this is a bit um, foreshadowing at least. So first of all, we'll see that the flow may incur some non-round or non-global singularities. And this will make it necessary to extend the flow past the first singular time. So you may have heard of surgeries. So we may have to, we will have to discuss what that means. 
And then we'll have some issues with continuous dependence on the initial data. You see, if you, in the previous slide, this whole argument uh, of constructing the deformation retraction only worked because we know that uh, the flow depends continuously on its, uh, on its initial condition, which can be shown using relatively standard analytical estimates. But now, since we may have to do these surgeries, uh, we'll run into some trouble. So I'll have to talk about this. All right, so what do we know about Ricci flow in dimension three? So let me give you a, a, a picture of what we know. So first of all, um, Ricci flow in dimension three is not as well, you know, is not as well controlled as in dimension two. So for example, there are very few quantitative estimates. So for example, you remember in the last slide, we could say exactly when the first singular time occurs based on the area of the initial time slice. Um, but, uh, but now these, these kind of estimates don't exist in dimension three. Uh, however, Perelman in his groundbreaking paper uh, found a qualitative classification of all the singularity models and um, could, uh, could carry out most of, um, uh, could carry out a lot of work using these qualitative uh, estimates. And then now there's recent work of uh, Simon Brendle and then there's an alternative approach by Bruce Kleiner and myself where we uh, give further classification of rotational symmetry of these kappa solutions. I'll get back to that later. All right, so, so let me be a bit more concrete. So what do, what do we know about Ricci flow in dimension three? Well, um, in order to uh, get, a, get a very quick picture of what the flow could do in dimension three, the, the, the best example to look at would be the so-called rotationally symmetric dumbbell. And I'll show you what this is, okay? So here, um, so what I want to consider is a, a, a three sphere, so a manifold that's homeomorphic to S3. And I want to put a metric on this manifold that's rotationally symmetric, so that's, uh, so that's invariant under a rotation that keeps the two poles fixed. So the orbits of this, uh, you know, uh, of this action would be, would be S2 or, or the two poles. Um, and the metric that I want, uh, the type of metrics that I want to consider should not be the round metrics on S3, but I want to consider metrics that look like a round three sphere of radius R1 on one end, and then a round sphere of uh, radius R3 on the other end. And then they should be connected by some kind of neck of, of width R2, where R1, R2, and R3 are some quantities that I have to choose. Okay. So if we did, this, uh, if we did uh, the same example in dimension two, then we would know that whatever radii we choose, the flow would always uh, flow the, uh, the manifold towards something round, modularly scaling. However, in dimension three, uh, uh, it's not that easy. So uh, it depends, the evolution of the flow depends very much on uh, how we choose those radii. So for example, if we choose the radii comparable to one another, so the neck is not too pronounced, then um, the neck will widen up further and further, and the metric will become asymptotically round uh, similar to what uh, happens in dimension two. And then if we rescale the flow here near the singularity, we'll see a round shrinking sphere. And this is called the singularity model of the singularity. And uh, the case, uh, whenever I see something like this, I'll, case the, I'll call this uh, uh, extinction. Um, or there's a question, is this a connected sum? Yeah, this is something like a connected sum, a geometrically a connected sum, yeah. Um, all right, so on the other hand, uh, if we choose the neck very thin, then the, um, um, then the flow will shrink the neck further and further and, um, um, and develop a singularity here. And the singularity, if I want to understand the singularity further, then um, uh, I can magnify the singularity and I'll see a singularity model, which is a round shrinking cylinder. So it's S2 cross R, where the S2 factor shrinks, shrinks down to a point and the R factor remains constant. And so this singularity is called a neck singularity or a neck pinch. And then there's an intermediate case where basically one of these uh, three spheres and the neck shrink at approximately the same rate. And in this case, we ob obtain a singularity here at the tip, and this is called a cap singularity. And the corresponding singularity model, so what, would we, what, what we would see if we magnified the singularity is, is, a, is some kind of paraboloid. Um, and it can be shown that it's uh, called a Brian soliton. All right, so we see this three different types of behaviors if we consider these rotationally symmetric flows. And if I had to summarize Perelman's big contribution in one sentence, then it would be that even in the non-rotationally symmetric case, these are all the, the, the only three singularity models that we see, okay? 
Um, of course, the proof is much more involved and uh, it's, it's slightly harder to state this. Um, so, um, all right, so. Um, the, the, uh, Richard, um, yeah. this question? Oh, I see this. Uh, is there a threshold? Yes, there is some threshold, but it's not a known one. So this is analysis uh, is uh, mainly due to um, uh, Anginant and Knopf. And, um, and so, so we only know some, some qualitative estimates here. I don't think we could come up with a precise threshold. All right. Um, OK, so maybe one thing that I also want you to observe here in this example is that in the, in the uh, second and third example, the uh, singularity formation is rather local. So the singularity only occurs in some region, but the flow away from the singularity still converges to something that's smooth. And it almost looks like the flow want, wants to continue, even though um, the flow globally has gotten stuck on this, this one local singularity. So what, what one would like to do is now extend the flow past this first singular singularity by removing this, uh, the, sing the singular set. And this is called a Ricci flow with surgery. It was, it was suggested by, by Hamilton and then carried out by, by Perelman using the singularity analysis. And that's what, what I want to focus on in the next slide. So the definition of a Ricci flow with surgery is quite technical. You know, it fills approximately a page but I think I can give you a pretty clear idea of what, what a Ricci flow with surgery is. So essentially, a Ricci flow with surgery is only um, a sequence uh, of Ricci flows on possibly different manifolds of maybe possible different topology on a consecutive sequence of time intervals. And these Ricci flows are related to one another by uh, what is called the surgery process. And so let me just show you a, a quick movie what the surgery process does. So let's say we start with some initial condition M G naught, and then we'll um, evolve this manifold by the Ricci flow until we, let's say, almost hit a singularity. And the type of singularity here that we see is a next singularity in this example. So what I'll do now is I'll locate, I'll locate um, two small cross-sectional two spheres uh, of, some, of some width uh, diameter delta, where delta should be very small, and I'll, I'll cut the manifold along these two spheres. And then what I'll obtain is a manifold with boundary. And then I'll fill in these boundary components with three disks. Okay? So what I'll do is basically the inverse of a connected sum. So I'll change the topology of the manifold, but I'll hopefully in somehow improve the geometry or somehow make, make, the, uh, make the geometry more, more regular by removing the singular part. So now I have a hopefully more regular manifold and then I can, I can continue the Ricci flow for a slightly longer time until I run into another singularity. And then maybe here I see the same behavior, uh, another neck pinch, so I do the same um, process. And here I may see a, an extinct component in which case I just say that the flow has done its job and I just discard it. And then I run the flow again and so on and so forth. And so somehow this whole um, sequence of Ricci flows is called a Ricci flow with surgery. Okay, let, before I continue, let me make two observations because they'll become, will be, become important later. So first of all, this whole construction depends on what we call a surgery scale, which is this delta, which again is the diameter of these little spheres along which we cut. And in order for this construction to work out, delta has to be some small and positive number. So it has to, yeah, it's been chosen as small, uh, uh, small enough. And then the second observation is the following. Um, we may see this in this, in this picture, namely it's the fact that regions of high curvature, or in, in other words, regions that are very close to being singular, they are very geometrically very close to these three green singularity models that I, I mentioned on the previous slide. So they're locally uh, very close to either a cylinder, a cap, or a sphere. And whenever this is the case, then uh, I say that the epsilon canonical neighborhood assumption is satisfied. So this definition is slightly more involved, but basically that's what it expresses. All right, um, are there any questions on this? Okay. Uh, do you require the number of intervals uh, is finite? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's actually, um, so in Perelman's work, uh, this, the number of intervals could be infinite. So there could be a surgery every second. There is no accumulation of surgery times, but it could be one every second and or one every minute um, for, you know, for all the time. But, um, um, but I later showed that 
at some point there won't be any surgeries anymore. So the flow will become um, become smooth. So, so but yeah, yeah. Uh, funnily, um, Perelman did not need this fact uh, in his work. Um, any other questions? Uh, when you do um, surgery with the dumbbell to eliminate it, presumably you want to choose the caps in the right place. I mean, if you choose them halfway along, then you won't have undone all of the region that's problematic. Yeah, that's a good point. Of course, we have to be very careful in where we perform the surgeries, yeah. And there's a lot of that I, I swept under the rug, yeah. I, I, have to, I have to perform the surgeries very far away from the region somehow that I remove a, a, enough to make the manifold regular. In. So there are like several scales we have to choose in order to make sure that this is true. Yeah, I mean, not so far away though that presumably you want, also want to be local to the degree that you respect the global geometry at some level, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it has to be like small enough so that we know the region is still cylindrical enough and so on. So that's, that, that's quite delicate. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, I have a question. This construction you described depends on delta. But I, in the end, I can send delta to zero and I have a definition that doesn't depend on delta. Is that what you do? Oh, yeah, but you, you basically told me, told, told everyone what I'm going to do in the next few slides. Ah. So, um, yeah, but basically this, this will, will, will become important later. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? All right, so let me move on. Um, so first of all, let me just mention again that this Ricci flow of surgery was used by Perelman to prove the Poincaré and geometrization conjectures. Uh, so it's a very powerful flow, you know, it can, it's on, so basically the, the idea of this proof was to, uh, uh, was to argue that the flow would improve the metric on the manifold um, to, uh, until we eventually have some kind of metric on the manifold that's somehow regular enough and that would let us guess what the topology of the manifold is. Okay, so this is a very powerful uh, flow, but uh, uh, there's one drawback in this uh, construction. And this is because it, it's that the surgery process, process is not canonical. Okay, so we always have to have to interfere with the flow and we have to do a surgery by hand. And the, the surgery that we perform depends on many surgery parameters. So for example, it depends on the choice of the surgery scale, so delta. And again, delta has to be small and positive and there's no canonical number that's both small and positive. And it depends on the uh, location of the surgery, um, next uh, and uh, uh, the surgery spheres and so on and so further. And even worse, if I somehow decided to perform a surgery slightly different at the first singular time, then this comp could completely change the evolution of the flow and then um, change the number of options that we would have later. Right? So we would get like a whole tree of different Ricci flows with surgery uh, starting from a given uh, uh, initial condition. And so even Perelman noticed this in both of his brown groundbreaking papers. So for example, in the first one he wrote, it is likely that one would get a canonically defined Ricci flow through singularities, but at the moment I don't have a proof of that. And in the second paper he wrote, our approach is aimed at eventually constructing a canonical Ricci flow, a goal that has not been achieved yet in the present work. All right. And so, so recently um, by work of um, Kleiner and Lott and then Bruce Kleiner and myself, we, um, we, uh, we verified Perelman's conjecture or question um, so namely, we, we showed the following. Um, we showed that there is a notion, a new notion of some sort of weak Ricci flow that flows through singularities on its own. So uh, we don't have to interfere with the flow and make any, any choices of how to perform the surgery. Uh, the flow will somehow perform the surgery on its own. And within this class of these weak flows, we have a, an existence and uniqueness theory uh, of these flows. So given some Riemannian manifold or some Riemannian metric on a manifold, there's a unique such weak Ricci flow that, uh, uh, that starts from this manifold. And then moreover, this flow is a limit of Ricci flows with surgery where we send the surgery scale go down to zero. Okay? So in other words, if I started with, the same, with some initial data and I constructed different versions of Ricci flows with surgery for smaller and smaller surgery scale, uh, then these would somehow limit to this, uh, to this nicer flow. Right? So in other words, this Ricci flow of surgery is an approximation of this nicer flow um, that, uh, that we claim to exist. Okay, so let, in the next slides, I want to tell you what this type of flow is. Uh, but before doing this, let me briefly digress and compare our situation with a mean curvature flow, which is a close cousin to the Ricci flow um, and, um, and concerns the evolution of um, embedded um, hypersurfaces often in Euclidean space. And so we could ask, well, 
you know, there's a similar question. Um, we could ask whether Perelman's conjecture is true for mean curvature flow. Um, well, first of all, we have to say what, the, what kind of weak flows we want to consider. Um, and there are two candidates. And there, since we are in mean curvature flow are talking about embedded surfaces, they're easier to define. They're called the level set flow and the Bracky flow. However, within the set of solutions, there's no uh, uh, uniqueness theory. So there's a theorem, uh, there's a phenomenon called fattening, and, um, and um, basically, which is uh, equivalent to saying that these flows are not uniquely uh, unique. Um, however, if we restrict to a more uh, uh, to, to, to a smaller class of mean curvature flows, namely the mean convex mean curvature flows, then uh, uh, then fattening doesn't occur. That's a theorem of Brian White, uh, which is equivalent to having uniqueness. So in this case, we we have a similar theory. And moreover, if we restrict an even more restrictive setting, namely the two convex case, then we have uniqueness, and this weak flow is a limit of mean curvature flows with surgery as the surgery scale goes to zero. So that somehow the full theorem would be true in this, in this setting. All right. And I see that there's a question in the chat, like limit in what sense? And this is, this is what I want to uh, um, uh, address in the next slide. So how do we actually take limits of sequences of Ricci flows with surgery? So again, a Ricci flow with surgery is a sequence of Ricci flows, but now I want to take a sequence of Ricci flows with surgery. So I want to take a sequence of sequences, basically. And so in order to do this, I want to switch the, somehow the picture of the way I'm, I'm viewing Ricci flows with surgery. Uh, so instead of saying that a Ricci flow with surgery is a sequence of Ricci flows, I want to slightly uh, view them differently. So namely, I'll consider every manifold and I'll take the Cartesian product with the, um, with the corresponding time interval. So these are the corresponding space times. And now I notice that at these adjacent boundary components, uh, they are almost isometric to one another, except in the surgery region. So what I can do is I, is I can identify them except for where the surgery points are. So I can basically glue uh, together points that survive each surgery, and I'll just remove all the uh, points that are related to surgeries. Okay, so I'll do this between any pair of um, space times. And so, so now if I glue together these, uh, these Cartesian products, what I'll obtain is a manifold that looks like this, okay? So again, these are these Cartesian products and I've placed a question mark wherever I've removed surgery points because I just didn't know how to, how to glue them together, uh, to glue pieces together in this area, okay? So what I obtain is a four manifold, which I'll uh, refer to as the space-time four manifold. And this four manifold comes with some structure uh, it comes uh, with a time function that tells me for every point what time it is at that point. Um, and uh, well, time slices are level sets of this time function. Then there's a time vector field that points in the positive time direction. So trajectories of this time vector field are correspond to points that are not moving under the Ricci flow uh, or are not moving. And then the Ricci flow metrics now give us one metric on the horizontal distribution. So that's the kernel of dt. So basically, it's, it's a metric that restricts to a Riemannian metric on every time slice. And lastly, the Ricci flow equation earns a lead derivative term on the left-hand side. Okay. Right. So whenever I see these objects, I'll call this a Ricci flow space-time. So that's a, it's a natural generalization of a, of a standard Ricci flow. Okay, so, um, and um, maybe one note that I want to make here is that whenever we perform such a construction, convert, uh, meaning converting a Ricci flow with surgery into a Ricci flow space-time, we have these holes here, you know, where I place those question marks, um, and they have roughly scale delta. So whenever I see these holes of scale delta, I say that the, uh, the Ricci flow space-time is delta complete. So it's somehow complete above scale delta. Um, all right, so, so this will become important later on. Okay, so this is just a different viewpoint. So I'm just, uh, um, so, uh, so I haven't really done anything right now. I've just, I've just uh, rephrased what a Ricci flow with surgery is. Um, but now this tip picture allows us to take our limits. And uh, this was done by Kleiner and Lott in 2014. And they showed that there's a compactness theorem for such Ricci flow space times. And then they did the following. They, they took a sequence of delta i going to zero. And for any given initial condition, they just looked at, a, at the corresponding sequence of Ricci, uh, Ricci flows with surgery for that corresponding delta i. 
uh, they, then they constructed the Ricci flow space times, uh, which were then delta i complete. And then they took a subsequence and said that the subsequence converges to a Ricci flow space time in the limit. Okay. And this limiting Ricci flow space time is somehow the one that we were looking for. And this is what, it, what we call a singular Ricci flow. So what's a singular Ricci flow? Well, I can actually define this uh, in this very small box. So the definition is, is actually much nicer than uh, Ricci flow with surgery. And it's the following. So a singular Ricci flow is a Ricci flow space time that satisfies two conditions. First of all, it is zero complete. So meaning that the holes have its diameter zero, or in other words, time slices can, can be completed by adding a discrete set of points. So the surgery skill is essentially zero here. And it satisfies the epsilon canonical neighborhood assumption uh, for small epsilon. So remember again, the epsilon canonical neighborhood assumption states that regions of high curvature look like cylinders, caps, or spheres. And so this, this flow indeed looks more canonical. You know, what, what, uh, and it performs surgeries on its own. So it flows through uh, singularities in a sense. And I've indicated this here on the bottom. So for example, here you see a neck. Uh, and the neck uh, shrinks down. And at the singular time, you, have, um, you, have, you see this double cone at, this, uh, at the singular time. And then right after the singular time, you see these two balls that go away from, from the double cone. So this may be, you've seen a similar picture in Morse theory, for example, probably. Okay. So however, let me make two remarks because there are very common misunderstandings that you can have about this flow. So first of all, this flow is, very similar to the, you know, is, is somewhat conceptually similar to the uh, level set flow or the Bracchi flow and curvature flow, and it's called a singular Ricci flow. However, the flow as it is defined is a completely smooth object. Okay? And the reason why it's a smooth object is because we haven't included the singular points here. So, um, so the, um, um, and, and we haven't really included the singular points because it's hard to make sense of the uh, Ricci flow equation on the singular set. So, for mean curvature flow, there are some barrier methods how you can make sense of the mean curvature flow equation or at a singular point or near a singular point, but, but for Ricci flow, this is very hard. So instead of saying what the Ricci flow equation does near the, on the singular set, we've introduced this, um, this epsilon canonical neighborhood assumption, which basically says what the flow does asymptotically near the singular set. So that's basically the replacement. Mm. And then, um, also, I want um, also the some of the comparison with the Morse theory, of course, is not completely accurate because uh, essentially on this manifold, the, the Morse function or the time function does ha doesn't have any critical points because those would be the singular points that we've removed. And then um, also the singular times may or may not accumulate, so we, we don't know whether this happens. So this might be a slightly more complicated object. Um, all right, so so again this. Do you get to choose delta i on the top page? Yes, you can choose any delta i going to zero. And then the theorem tells you that you can pass to a subsequence and obtain a singular, uh, singular Ricci flow on the limit. But this um, indeed touches upon my point here. Um, these, this, this flow looks very canonical because it seems to flow through, through singularities on its own, but it's not clear whether uh, it's uniquely determined by its initial data. You know, because this, the existence here was shown using a compactness theorem. So you start with some arbitrary sequence of delta i going to zero, and um, then you, you know that you have convergence for some subsequence, but you could have different subsequence that converge to different singular Ricci flows. Um, or in other words, some of the resolution of the singularity could not, um, may a priori not be unique. Um, I have a question. You, you mentioned that the singularity may accumulate. But uh, yeah. previously, you mentioned that you only need finitely many surgeries. Oh, uh, okay. would, would that imply that there's no accumulation? I'm a little bit confused here. Okay, yeah, yeah, good point. So in, in a Ricci flow with surgery, there are only finitely many surgeries. Um, but as you let delta i go to zero, uh, the number of surgery angles. Uh, ah, okay, and yes. You end up with a Cantor set. It could end, I think the dimension of the singular set of singular times uh, the, the one half Hausdorff dimension, it, uh, it, uh, Hausdorff dimension of this is one is less or equal to one half. That's the only thing. We I see. Thank you. Uh, but uh, that's a good point. Uh, but still, for this flow, after a certain time, there won't be any surgeries anymore or any singularities anymore. 
So that, that's still true. So that there's some positive time after which this flow is completely smooth and, um, and non-singular. Any, any other questions? Uh, do, uh, does, uh, does a careful choice of delta i's avoid singularities? Oh, no, as we'll see in a moment, because we'll see in a moment that we have uniqueness and therefore any choice of deltas uh, will produce the same, the same singular flow. All right, so, so as I said, this, res this existence result does not give us uniqueness. And so this is what we, what we showed in, in a separate theorem later. So we, maybe we showed that M is uniquely determined by its initial time slice. So given these two conditions of, um, of a singular uh, Ricci flow, we know that it's uh, up to isometry completely determined by the initial time slice. Okay. So, so and, and therefore, this singular Ricci flow is not only a subsequential limit of Ricci flows with surgery, it's actually a limit of Ricci flows with surgery, no matter which delta i you choose. Okay, so to summarize, this solves uh, Perelman's conjecture and it shows that for any Riemannian manifold, compact three-dimensional Riemannian manifold, there is up to isometry a canonical singular Ricci flow with this manifold as, as its initial time slice. And I'll often denote this by m upper g. Okay, so whenever we have a metric g, there is, there is one singular Ricci flow starting from this. Are there any questions on this? Um, okay, so what I want to highlight here is that uh, uniqueness also gives us um, some continuous dependence on the initial data. And this is an important byproduct of this theorem. And I'll, I'll show you what uniqueness has to do on the next, uh, with, uh, uh, has to do with continuous dependence on the next slide. So here's an example. So let me consider um, a manifold and consider a continuous family of metrics on this manifold, parameterized by some parameter S that runs from zero to one. And then based on this family, I'll construct for every S, I'll construct the corresponding singular Ricci flow starting from this metric. And now I want to understand whether these flows depend continuously on, on S, okay? And so let me look at the following uh, type of example. So they look awfully similar, uh, familiar. So the flow, uh, the, the initial conditions look like this. First of so for S is equal to zero, I see this dumbbell that has a very weak neck. And then for S is equal to one, I see this neck, which is very thin. And then, um, you know, then let me evolve the flow for S is equal to zero. I may get a singular Ricci flow, which is just given by a standard conventional normal Ricci flow. And then for S is equal to one, I may see a non-degenerate neck pinch. Okay. So now if I move the parameter from zero towards the right, there are analytic reasons why I have continuous dependence, just because this is a standard Ricci flow, at least for some, for some time. And if I move the parameter for, from S is equal to one to the left, at least I have continuous dependence of the flow up until the first singular time. And it may be conceivable to somehow extend this continuous dependence um, uh, be, beyond the first singular time. However, there's going to be um, a critical parameter um, where somehow I switch from one of these types of flows to the other. And let's say this all occurs at uh, the parameter one half. And that's where I see this type of cap singularity. And well, this cap singularity could be reached from either side. So this could be either a limit of conventional Ricci flows, or it could be a limit of these non-degenerate neck pinches. And there's no a priori no reasons why these two limits have to be the same. However, due to the uniqueness theorem, uh, we know that there's only one such singular Ricci flow at time one half, and therefore we have continuous dependence. Okay. Um, when can you expect a canonical non-singular Ricci flow? Oh, that's, that's hard to decide. Yeah, I mean, there are certain criteria when, when you have a non-canonical non-singular Ricci flow, but, um, but that's not, um, um, not clear. Um, all right. Um, okay, so, so the theorem gives us, um, so this uniqueness theorem also produces this continuous dependence. And a vague statement of the continuous dependence, you know, I've just written it down here, a vague statement would be that the singular Ricci flow depends continuously on its initial metric as, as we would expect. But however, you know, notice that a singular Ricci flow is, de you know, is defined on some space-time four manifold, and this might, may vary as we vary the initial condition. So it's actually not that easy to state what continuous dependence means. So in order to state this, we have to do some, you know, some extra work. And um, in the interest of time, let me skip this, the details here. So basically what one has to do is one has to embed those singular Ricci flows into like a larger topological space. And then one can view the singular Ricci flows as a lamination transverse to which you can test whether things are continuous or not. Um, 
but um, but essentially the the statement is that we have continuous dependence. All right. Um, okay. So this this concludes the uh, uh, analytic part of this talk. So in the last two slides and in, in the last five minutes, what I would like, would like to do is I want to like to show you how this continuous dependence result of singular Ricci flows can be used to prove um, one of the topological results that I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk. And so the topological result I want to focus on is the generalized Smale conjecture. Again, this states that diffeomorphism group is homotopy equivalent to the isometry group. Um, and I want to follow the same um, strategy as in dimension two. So again, what, what was the strategy? Well, the strategy was to show that the space of constant curvature metrics on M or, uh, um, is, is, is contractible. And in dimension two, this was done by constructing a retraction from the space of metrics, which is contractible, onto the space. Okay. And in dimension two, the, uh, the retraction was given by, just given directly by the Ricci flow. So you take a metric, you evolve it by the Ricci flow, you look at what the limit is, and that's going to be the, um, the image of your map. Okay. So let's try to uh, do the same strategy in dimension three. So what do we get? Well, first of all, if we take a metric, then we get a, we don't, now we don't get a singular Ricci flow defined on the manifold itself. We only get a singular Ricci flow that's defined on some space-time four manifold. Okay, so we get, you know, schematically we get a map from the space of metrics to the space of singular Ricci flows. So what's missing here is now a map from the space of singular Ricci flows again, back to the space of constant curvature metrics on the given manifold. Okay, so this, this map with the question mark is the one that we need to construct. Okay, and, um, and so in order to do this, as I told you before, there are two different proofs. And uh, what I want to do in the last slide is focus on the short proof. So this is basically uh, 30 pages. And it works if we assume that M is not S3 or RP3. And it also as, uh, makes use of the snail conjecture for S3. So it makes use of Hatcher's theorem for S3. Okay. Um, are there any questions on the setup? All right. So we want to construct this map. And so I'll explain this now as follows. I'll take one singular Ricci flow. I'll draw a picture of one singular Ricci flow. And I'll give you, I'll, sh I'll show you a recipe how to use the singular Ricci flow to extract a constant curvature metric from it. And, um, and then we'll do some hand waving and you, you, you should somehow see that this, this recipe is in some sense continuous, uh, depends continuously on the singular Ricci flows. All right, so uh, let me do this in the last slide. So here is a singular Ricci flow. So we start with some arbitrary metric on our spherical space form. And again, this is not the, th not the sphere or not RP3, so it has some non-trivial topology. And now, it, and it, and so it develops um, two singularities. So one singularity here, one or two neck pinches, one neck pinch here. Uh, and on, in this neck pinch, uh, the manifold splits into two pieces. One is homeomorphic to a three sphere and the other manifold is homeomorphic to the uh, original manifold. And then here it has another neck pinch where uh, I think the, the, the left one is homeomorphic to the uh, original manifold and the right one is homeomorphic to the three sphere. Okay. Um, and, um, and then the flow becomes somehow um, asymptotically round. Okay, so, so here, here are two observations about this flow, which will be important. Um, they're relatively elementary. First, my first observation is that in, whenever there's a singularity, the manifold gets separated or a neck pinch, the manifold gets separated into two parts. So basically there's going to be the inverse of a connected sum decomposition. However, since our manifold is prime, so it cannot be con uh, disconnected into two non-trivial pieces, one of these pieces will always be a three-sphere and the other piece will always be homeomorphic to the original manifold. So there's going to be, we can always say which is the piece that somehow carries the main topology. Um, and then moreover, at some point, this piece that has the main topology will become sufficiently round so that there's no, not going to be any further neck pinch. So in other words, the space-time four manifold will have an end, which I've colored here in yellow, on which the flow is just given by a standard um, uh, conventional Ricci flow on, on a manifold that's homeomorphic to the original manifold. And we also know that this Ricci flow will become asymptotically round. So modular scaling, this will converge to a constant curvature metric on here. So as we approach this 
uh, singular time T2, I think, or final time T2, the flow will, will produce a constant curvature metric um, on, on, on this manifold here, or on this, you know, on this end. So this is the first observation. Uh, is it possible to land uh, on a constant curvature, but on a different manifold N than M? So no, the, uh, the, the point here is that the topology of this time slice is always the same as the topology as the initial manifold. So with it, in, in the process of the surgery, we only pinch off spheres. Um, all right, so now let me, uh, uh, let me say what the second observation is. So in the second observation, I'll take I'll look at points in the, in, the, in the yellow region, in the upper yellow region, and I'll look at the trajectories of the time vector field um, corresponding to these points. I'll move backwards on the time vector field, and I'll see where I, in, where I end up in the time zero slice. Okay? Um, and so there are two cases. Either the trajectory will exist for all the way up to time zero, or there will be a trajectory that runs into a singularity. And if the corresponding trajectory runs into a singularity, then I'll, um, um, then I'll call this a, a, bad, a bad point, okay? So, and here's the observation, which was due to uh, Kleiner and Lott. And the observation is that in every component of every time slice, there are only finitely many bad points. So except for finitely many points, all these points can be followed backwards to time zero. Okay? And so what I'll do now is I'll, denote the set of, uh, of points at time zero that, that arise by, by following points from the, from the yellow uh, component uh, by trajectories, I'll denote this by W. Okay, so the projection of all these yellow points, except for the bad points, onto time zero by the flow of the time vector field will be called W. Okay, and um, I can do the same with the metric. So the metric on, on this yellow area for every time. I can push forward by the flow of the time vector field and uh, I can view it as a metric on W. So those are two, two isometric metrics. Okay? So W comma G bar T is just isometric to the corresponding metric on, 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 on the corresponding time slice minus those bad points. And well, and, and lastly, I can take a limit. So now let, let me take the limit and um, then what I know by observation one is that this uh, metric uh, converges to a constant curvature metric. Um, and this constant curvature metric, well, will be isometric to the uh, metric that I get in the limit on the yellow part minus those bad points. So W comma G bar is isometric to um, a punctured spherical space form, a spherical space form minus finitely many points. Okay. Um, um, okay, so there's another question that I also wanted to address this. What are these bad points saying here? So for every bad point, uh, there's going to be some region here in the complement of W. And what we know about this complement is that it essentially can be covered by finitely many disks. And that's going to be important in a moment. Okay. Right, so whenever I see um, an open subset of the initial manifold, W, and a metric G bar such that W and G bar uh, is isometric to a punctured spherical space form, I will call this a partially defined constant curvature metric. And basically what I've, what I've explained to you is now a recipe how to, uh, how to assign to every metric a partially defined metric on M. Okay, so again, how does this work? Let's recap. So we take a metric on M called G, then we consider the corresponding singular Ricci flow which maybe lives on some other uh, space-time four manifold. And then we co co uh, consider, uh, construct this corresponding partially defined metric uh, WG bar. Okay. And this map can be shown to be continuous because we have continuous dependence of, a, uh, of the singular Ricci flow on its initial data and this whole construction is continuous. And so lastly, sorry, I'm going over time. Uh, what we can do now is we can construct a continuous map from the space of partially defined metrics to the space of constant curvature metrics by some obstruction theory arguments. So we can basically extend these metrics defined on W uh, over these uh, disks um, uh, onto the complement. And so this can be done um, uh, using some obstruction theory and using Hatch's resolution of this male conjecture. Um, so, um, and so this gives us an, uh, a continuous map from the uh, set of partially defined metrics to the set of metric, constant curvature metrics on M and so if we compose both maps, um, then we get the desired retraction and, um, and finish the proof of the generalized conjecture.
All right, so this is, I think, all I want to say, and I'm sorry for going over time. I completely missed the time. <laughs>